الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم My respected teacher, Professor Hamid Sharif Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh I was surprised after Juma Khutbah when somebody approached me and said, were you a student at International Islamic University? And you know, after the khutbah, you don't check with the khatib because he behaves like a Fir'aun. <laughs> and suddenly somebody comes and asks me about International Islamic University and I looked at the face and the face is very familiar. And then he said, did you teach over there too? So I thought, this guy knows me inside out. So, and then he says, do you know somebody with Hamid? And said, are you Professor Hamid Sharif? So I kissed him and I hugged him, mashallah. And it's an honor to have him among the audience. And now it will be very difficult for me to speak. But as they say, al-amru fawk al-adab, that now this is the area where I might be talking in his presence. So I hope that he allows me. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was the professor in Sharia department, law department. I was in Muqarnat al-Adiyan or Rasul al-Din. And then we became, he was the senior professor, I was the lecturer, and I still remember going to Lahore together for that book fair. So, a lot of memories. <coughs> when it comes to the founding fathers of America or the founding of the American nation, many people, especially the Muslim, think that Islam has nothing to do with the American founding. Because the Muslim contribu contributions to American founding has been kind of obliterated by the Eurocentric historians. When they rewrote the history, they excluded everything of Islam and Muslims from it. So I'm going to test your general knowledge before I go to the presentation. And that questions will not be asked from my professor. So it's only from you. Now, let me ask you this question. Who would tell me where is this dome from? Can anybody tell me? Congress? Guess. Library of Congress, yes. This is the main dome of the Library of Congress. Now, look at the dome and look at the 14 civilizations which are depicted inside. And you look at the middle of the dome and you will see this is the Virgin, the American civilization, which has derived from the other 14 civilizations and you will see that Islam is one of them. Let me go to the next one. Do you see Islam somewhere? So, the painting shows that from the Greek, or actually from the Jewish civilization, we got our religion. From Judea, we got religion, because among the Christian books, as you know, in the Christian Bible, we have got two portions. One is the Old Testament, and the other is the New Testament. Old Testament is what we call the Hebrew Bible, the Jewish Bible. So therefore, it says that from Judea, we got religion. From Greece, we got philosophy. From the Romans, we got administration. And here, basically, you look at from Islam, we got the physical sciences. So physical sciences, which are the base of what chemistry, biology, you name it. So, Science is the American founding fathers 
or the American elites, they believed that the science, we got it from what? From Islam. And right now, this is the main issue, the main bone of contention. We Muslims and everybody else thinks Muslim never contributed anything in the Islamic world when it comes to the science itself. Am I clear? While the founding fathers, the early elites, they felt that America got its physical sciences from home, from Islam. Now, what is the reason? The reason is, as you know, the Greco-Roman sciences, they were quite prevalent when Christianity came and became dominant in the Roman Empire. Christianity believed that science, and especially Greco-Roman sciences, they were based upon polytheistic religion because Aristotle, Plato, they did not believe in God according to them, and especially they did not believe in the Trinity or in Jesus. So therefore, they prohibited study of sciences. All the academies, the Roman and the Greek, Greek you know, academies, they were closed by the church. And then many of those people who were the experts in Greco-Roman sciences, they were persecuted and expelled from the Christendom. That's where you see most of them, they came to the Islamic world of that time. The Nestorians, the Arians, and many of the other heretics, they came and that's where during the time of Al-Amin, the son of Harun al-Rashid, they opened Dar al-Hikmah, the house of wisdom. And these Christians, they translated the books of Aristotle, Plato, and the medical sciences into Arabic language. And that's where Muslims studied Aristotle, Plato, Galen, and the other medical sciences, and then studied them from Islamic perspective. All of those ideas were, which were polytheistic and against Islamic concept of what? Tawheed, Akhirah, morality, they were purged off. And Islamic elements were added to it. And then Muslims studied the Persian, the Egyptian, and also the Indian sciences. Nobody knows that the numerals were Indian. And I was really astonished to study that the first introduction of Indian numerals took place in Texala, which is now in Pakistan. And it was the Buddhist. The Buddhist were the first one to introduce the Indian numerals. And when they accepted Islam, they were invited by the Abbasid Caliphate and they introduced the Indian numerals into the Islamic sciences. And from there, the Indian, what, which were later called the Arabic or Islamic numerals, were introduced to Europe in 14th century. So now, what the Muslims created, they created a synthesis from the Greco-Roman sciences, Persian, Indian, as well as the Egyptian, so from the 8th century onward till 16th century, Muslims were the leaders of science and technology in every way and every form. So this is what our founding fathers basically accepted that from Islam we got the uh, physical sciences and from Middle Ages you could basically look at it and then from Italy, we got our arts. From England, we got our language. But when it comes to the science, Islam is depicted as the source. Let me ask you about this famous picture. Who would tell me about this picture? There was a controversy, a huge controversy about it. So I'm sure you must know about it. Yes, sir. Supreme Court. As you know, this panel is behind the Supreme Court judges. They are told that our law is derived from these 14 founders of law. And among them is Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 
So the Supreme Court judges are given this message that when you derive the law, when you implement the law, look at the sources of American law. And Prophet Muhammad, you can see over there in the middle, here, you see he has got the Quran in his left hand and the sword in his right hand. The controversy took place when some of the Muslims took it to the Supreme Court and said, we are not allowed to portray or depict Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we want this picture to be removed from the Supreme Court. And then the Chief Justice at that time said, actually this is not meant to be disrespectful, but it honors the Prophet of Islam as one of the great lawgivers. So therefore we want to honor him and honor our founding father's wishes. So we will keep it but if there is any way or form any Muslim feels that somehow it's not respectful, then they need to understand the history of this picture. So therefore, now some of these right-wing Christians, when they look at the picture, they say, look, our founding fathers, they knew the true nature of Prophet Muhammad Sallam. They knew he was a violent person. That's where you see he has got the sword in his hand. But you do not know the history that when they were putting this picture, they discussed it a great deal. And look at the sword. Sword is not upward. Sword is downward. And he is grabbing the sword. What? Because remember, in the left hand is the Quran. So what is said? The message is that whenever it comes to implementation of law, he used the power for the sake of what? Justice, for the sake of truth. Otherwise, his sword was never used. So what was the message? That all of these issues of violence and all of these issues that Prophet Muhammad was a violent terrorist, the founding fathers and the elites, they said, no. He used the power only to implement law and to establish justice. So Quran is the source of law and the message is that if it comes to using the force for the sake of justice, equality and proper use of law, America will use it but never will use it for the sake of what? Any other reason. Now can somebody tell me about this picture? This painting. Just in your right. Yes, sir. Is this Harvard Law School? No, the next picture will be coming from there. Anybody else? Do you know Nancy Pelosi? So this is in the Capitol building. Now, you can look at the pictures and on the bottom left is the Suleiman, Sultan Suleiman Al-Qanuni, the most magnificent Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. And with him is Thomas Jefferson. <coughs> Do you see? Thomas Jefferson. <coughs> Me, was a student of Sultan Suleiman al Kanuni. He studied him so much that we are told that he almost memorized his rulings. Because Sultan Suleiman al Kanuni was the first Ottoman ruler who put the Ra law incorporating Christian and Jews into Islamic Ottoman Empire. Because when he conquered Bosnia, Greece, do you know almost 55 to 60 percent of the Ottoman Empire was consisting of the Christians. And actually so many of them had accepted Islam that we are told that in 600 years of history of the Ottoman Empire, almost 80 percent 
the grand wazirs were mostly those who had accepted Islam, converted from Christianity to Islam. And one of the historians who visited the Ottoman Empire in 1635, he said that there are more converted Muslims, more converted like those who converted from Christianity to Islam, than the original born Turks in the Ottoman Empire. So therefore, this is what is the message that Thomas Jefferson learned the law because Thomas Jefferson believed in pluralism. He wanted to establish an empire or a country where people can have religious freedom, where people can worship the way they want to, and he was resenting the fact that Christianity does not allow this kind of freedom. So he based his knowledge of law and the constitution upon the Ottoman constitution studying mostly what? Sultan Suleiman al Kanuni, and that's what is, I remember one time going to the Capitol building and asking some of the lawmakers about this picture. And majority of them said, never thought of it, never looked at it. And when they were asked to give us some information, they did not know it. So when they were told about it, they said, fascinating, we'll go back and study. Unfortunately, many of the people do not study the history and they do not know the intricacies of that history. That's where, and unfortunately, we Muslims, we are so focused upon our own masjids, upon inner fighting, <laughs> upon, mashallah, destroying each other, that we do not have the time to study history. And especially when it comes to intellectual history, we do not study it at all. If you want to make them sleep, mashallah, talk about any intellectual you know, topic. And because we are unable to study and share it with them, Americans are not interested so our children think we have never contributed anything to America, or we have got no contribution into science, while the founding fathers were saying America got its science from home, from Islam. We got our law from Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Quran is one of the sources of American law. And Sultan Suleiman al-Kanuni is the teacher, the legal teacher you can call, the mentor of our founding father, American pluralism is based upon what? Upon Ottoman Empire. Now, let me check. Yeah, this is the closest uh, you can think of. This is what you were talking about. When you go to Harvard School of Law, this is the verse of the Quran basically written as soon as you enter on the main board. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu kunu qawwamina bil qist shuhada alillah wa la yajrimannakum shana'an qawmin ala alla ta'dilu i'dilu huwa aqrabu lit taqwa o you who believe stand out firmly for justice and you know that the ayah so when a student enters the harvard law school he is being told because they said that this is the most comprehensive statement about justice in the world. Now, this is a test of everybody. Which masjid is this, this historical masjid? And where is that? Our brother has been rescuing everybody and speaking on behalf of everybody. I want somebody else to tell me. I'm sure you must have seen this masjid. It is in the US. Not Massachusetts, that's too far. Chicago. Because it's written over there, I want everybody to look at it. This is in downtown Chicago, 600 North Wabash Avenue, in the heart of downtown. Do you know it was built in 1920s? as Medina Masjid, and right now it is a casino. 
there were people before you and me who considered themselves as Unitarians. And they used to build masjids, Medina Masjid, Makkah Masjid. And let me show you the picture of the main door of that Medina Masjid, then it became temple, and right now it is casino. Can you see La ilaha illallah written over there? La ghaliba illallah. And it's a shame for Muslims not to connect with those people who were ahead of us, before us. We thought this is Shriners, this is such and such. And right now, it is a casino. So Islam was here long before you and me. I will have to give a lecture about it, inshallah, sometime. But I am just showing you some of these signs. La ghaliba illallah. And I'll come back and show you that in every big city of America, there used to be a masjid. Even here in Detroit. And maybe I'll take a tour with you to go and look at that masjid which was established in 1899, here in Detroit. And you will see the same ayat over there. But once we came, we isolated ourselves. We never studied the American history. And we thought we are the first Muslims here. But we forgot that this country originally was built against Christianity and upon the principles of Islam. So now let's talk about Thomas Jefferson. <clears throat> Thomas Jefferson was a planter, a diplomat, and a philosopher. He is the author of the Declaration of Independence. Now let me ask you about the Declaration of Independence. Do we know the history of that, or shall I say a few words about it? As you know, British Crown controlled the three colonies. And when they declared independence, it was against the British Crown, just to make it simple. And then he is also the author of the Constitution of America. So you can imagine how important he was. He was the third president and actually the second vice president. He was the vice, actually, he was the secretary of state for Washington, George Washington, the first president. Then came John Adams, and he was his vice president. And then he became the third president of America. He is the founder of University of Virginia. And actually, this was his wish that on my grave, I do not want to be mentioned as the president or as the founding father of America, but write the founder of University of Virginia. He really, really, uh, you know, wanted to be appreciated as an intellectual, as somebody who was enlightened. He was born in 1743 on one of the plantation in the colony of Virginia. His father was very rich, and he had privileged upbringing and education. Now, at the age of 17, he joined the College of William and Mary in Williamburg, Virginia. Very, very historical area, Williamburg. And there he came across Professor William Small, who was his teacher, who taught him philosophy, mathematics, and metaphysics. And his other professor, Professor George Witt, was an attorney, the known attorney of that time. And Thomas Jefferson was exposed to the Quran and Islamic law in William and Mary. And let me explain to you, because he first purchased the copy of the Quran when he was student at William and Mary. Why? Because here I had to explain a little bit, and now you will have to give me uh, uh, some attention. Let me go to next one. OK. Uh, let me go here. As you know, British Crown is ruling these 13 colonies. And these landlords and Thomas Jefferson you know, Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, Washington, all of them are what? 
the planters. All of them are the owners of plantation. The British army comes and the king issues the order that the armies will be staying wherever they can find the food and place. And these planters do not want those army people to come and live on their plantations. He puts the different kinds of taxes, now 33%, now 55%, because we are engaged in a fight against France, against such and such. So he puts whatever taxation he wants. He does not accept anything from the colonies. So Thomas Jefferson, as a young man, like everybody else has got the question, who gave the king the authority? And everybody tells king rules on behalf of God. Because this is what is the concept I really want you to understand. In the medieval Christianity, as you know, among the Muslims, what was the worldview? Worldview was that in the heavens there are three persons in one Godhead. That's what is called Trinity. God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and God the Son. So as there are three persons in Godhead, and in the world, there are three representatives of God upon the face of the world. King represents God the Father. Nobility represent God the Son. Clergy and priest, they represent God the Holy Spirit. So as there is Trinity in the heavens, there is Trinity. Have you heard the word of three realms of estate? In France, in England, everywhere, what was said? There are three realms of estate. First is what? Nobility. Second is clergy. And third is what? Commoners. Even right now, you have house of lord and house of commoners. So therefore, royalty, nobility, clergy. These are the people who are created by God to rule. Commoners are the ones who are supposed to serve them. They were consisting of 2% in Europe. You can imagine even right now in Saudi Arabia or in Emirat. I mean, in Saudi Arabia, there are a total of 6,000 princes. But they are the one who own 99% of the resources. Same thing was happening. Royalty was less than, five, less than 1%. Nobility was less than 1.8%. And clergy was less than 0.2%. So total of 2% of the population got 100% of resources. And commoners were there to serve. They were not allowed to have their own property. They were not allowed to even give vote. They had nothing. I mean, look at 17th, 18th century England, France, everywhere. So this is where Thomas Jefferson as a student will start asking the question, who gave this authority to the king? And that's where William Samal told him that you need to study Islam. Because Islam says that the rights are not given by the king. They are given by God to everybody because they are equally created by God. And that's where he mentions to him the objectives of Islamic Sharia. That in the Islamic world, <clears throat> look at John Locke, look at Isaac Newton, they have discussed this issue. Study John Locke, and he studied John Locke. And what does John Locke say? That Islam says, or that there are five objectives of Islamic Sharia, which is, hefzid, uh, first of all, Hafzid Haya the preservation of life. Hafz al-Din, preservation of religious freedom and religion. Hafz al-Nasl, the preservation of family. Hafz al-Mal, preservation of property. And Hafz al-Aqal, preservation of reason. These are God-given rights. Nobody can take anybody's life. Nobody can take anybody's property. Nobody can tell anybody who to marry and who not to marry. Now, do you know that King Henry VIII of England, 
why he separated from the Catholic Church because he wanted to divorce his wife and the church would not allow because according to them divorce was not permitted. So that's where he got what the Church of England separated. It was not allowed for anybody in Christian world to marry without the permission of the church and divorce was impossible. So when he came to know that these are the inalienable human rights, this is the first time he purchased the copy of the Quran as a student and started studying. Since then, he became very much interested in the Ottoman history. Because right now, we Muslims are nobody, but in the 16th and 17th century, you know, half of Europe was controlled by the Ottoman Empire. Ottoman Empire were sitting in the middle of the world, Persian Empire on that side, the Moroccan on that side, and the Mughal on this side. The whole world was basically being dictated by the Muslim empires. If you look at the history, the Mughal Empire controlled 29% of world GBT. It was such a rich empire. So to study at that time how to build an empire, he studied Ottoman Empire. And I will come back sometime and explain to you that Washington Cathedral and many of the universities were constructed using the masjid architect. And even they are facing towards Qibla. I'll come and I'll explain to you because it will take me so much, you know, uh, you know explanation because it seemed like, you know, uh, you will have to study some history. But you will be astonished when this was disclosed that Washington Cathedral is facing towards Qibla and the architect was summoned. He said because it is going through Mecca to face Jerusalem. Our Christian <laughs> Qibla is Jerusalem, so it's also on the same direction. <laughs> but I'll tell you the hidden history. They were Unitarians. So this is where he became very much interested in the study of Islam and Islamic law. And this is where his entire enlightenment, what we call the uh, enlightenment interest began at the uh, Williams and Berry. I know I don't want to take too much of your time. Let me go straight to. <clears throat> now, let me ask you this one question. Have you heard about inquisition? Religious persecution or burning on the stake? As the king was absolute, that nobody can ask him the question, he makes the law, breaks the law. In the same fashion, religious arena, church and pope were absolute. You don't ask anybody, why Trinity? Why God made the king superior or made the nobility superior or made the clergy superior? If you ask this question, they will burn you on the stake. As right now, many Muslims are being burned and killed in the Islamic world. Because they are asking the question, why in the name of Sharia only this law applies to me and not to the royal family? Our former president, prime ministers, all of them have been sitting in our prison. Imran Khan is sitting in the prison. Before that, Nawaz Sharif was, whenever you challenge the absolute authorities, they come after you. Here, everybody, I mean, you just say a few words and you are a terrorist. So labeling persecuting, this has been part and parcel of what? Governance. And this is what was happening. So the alternate was the Islamic concept of Tawheed. So instead of that, there are three in the heavens. Islam came with the idea that God is one. He has created all the human beings equally. There's no difference between the royals, between the nobles and between the commoners. Inna akramakum, indallahi atkaku. This was the revolution which Islam brought. Abu Jahal and Abu Lahab are not superior than Bilal and Suhaib. This was the main problem. It was not the Salah and Zakah and Hajj. Those kuffar did it better than you and me. 
They were cleaning the Kaaba. That's what was the problem. Abu Jahl said, I serve Kaaba more than you, O Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And you tell me that I am a person of Jahannam? Because he thought himself superior. They persecuted people. That's what Islam is. So <clears throat> this was the alternate Islamic concept. And then this concept is very important for you to understand. In Christianity, <clears throat> Nobody was allowed to have any other belief system. Originally it was Catholic. So nobody can follow any other church other than Catholics. Then in the 16th century, Protestantism protested against it. <clears throat> now they divided Europe into Catholics, Lutheran, Calvinist, Anglican. So if you live in England, you cannot follow Lutheran or Catholic. If you will follow Lutheran or Catholic, you will be killed. In Calvinist area, you cannot follow Lutheran. So one king, one church, one law. So there was no religious freedom, no religious. In Islamic world, when they went in the 16th century, Istanbul, they have got every kind of church. They have got Jewish temples. They have got Sunnis and Shia. This is Hanafi Masjid. This is Maliki Masjid. This is Shafi Masjid. And then Quran says, La ikraha fi deen. There is no compulsion in the matter of religion. Church is your personal idea. You can believe in whatever you want to. The Sultan cannot tell you, you become a Muslim or a Hanafi or Maliki. So they said, church and state are separated. This is what they wanted. We want to separate the church from the state. No persecution is allowed based upon religion. You can be Sunni, you can be Shia, and the Sultan cannot kill you because you happen to be Shia, or a Christian, or a Jew. And actually, the ministers of the Sultan are Christians and Jews. So they wanted the same thing in England. We want freedom of religion. This is what Thomas Jefferson loved. The biggest idea which really influenced him is the separation of church and state. He said, look at the Islamic world, why they are successful? Because the Jews, Christians, Hindus, everybody participate in the business. When you go to the market, nobody asks you whether you are Catholic or you are Jew, you are Muslim. When it comes to participation in the state, everybody equally participates and contributes. When it comes to religion in their own masjid, this one prays like Sunni, this one prays like Shia, the Christian goes to his church. This is what I want to accomplish in America. So Mithak of Medina, he studied it so many times, which is the constitution of Medina, where the Prophet wasalam, allowed the Jews and the others to be equal citizens of the Islamic State. And he wanted to build American constitution based upon that state. And one more thing which really impressed him, that the Sultan, after having so much power, he is equal in front of everybody when it comes to Islamic Sharia law. Because three sultans were strangled to death because one of them was found touching wine and he was publicly hanged. One of them married without the permission, you know, he was strangulated. And one of them was hunting when jihad was going on and he was publicly strangulated by the fatwa of Sheikh al Islam. So they were really astonished that the sultan is equal to Islamic law. Then they figured out that there is what distribution of power. The executive power is with the Sultan. Legislative power is with the ulama. The judicial power is with the Qadis. Am I clear? So he wanted to have the distribution of executive, legislative, and 
judiciary. So this is what is in America. Executive is Mr. Biden. Legislative is Congress and Senate. Judiciary is what? Supreme Court. Now, when the trouble is between Biden and Trump, who is making the decision? Neither Trump nor Biden, Supreme Court. Am I clear? So this distribution was the most Im, you know, important thing which was on the mind of the founding fathers. So <clears throat> that's where, now you can look at these uh, famous paintings <clears throat> in Europe. This is what, that there is a trinity at the top which is ruling everybody. You see the crown over there? You see the nobility and you see the clergy. They are at the top of the pyramid and everybody else is beneath them. Mm, this is what was called the Trinity. Here, the nobility and the clergy are riding on the horse and the donkey of commoners. 98% are slave, commoners, and the others are nobles and clergy. This is another that in the whole country or in the whole nation, <clears throat> one vote for the clergy. One vote for nobility and 98% have got what? One vote. So this is what was the problem. And here are the persecution. You know, anybody who asked the question is burnt on the stake. You see over there? When you burn people on the stake, nobody will dare to ask the question after that. So these were the persecution which they did not want to have here. Now, this is the copy of Thomas Jefferson's Quran. It is in the Library of Congress. This was George Sale's translation and perhaps the most beautiful translation of that time. <clears throat> this is the copy of his Quran, which is in the Smithsonian. And you will be astonished that he has got so much notes. It seems he studied, especially the legal aspect, he studied a lot. Now, you know this famous picture? When Keith Ellison became the member of the Congress, they wanted him to have the oath upon the Bible, and he said, I will do it on the Quran. They said, this is un-American. So he went to the Library of Congress, picked up the Thomas Jefferson's Quran and said this is the most American thing to take the oath upon Thomas Jefferson's Quran. You see Nancy Pelosi? So this is the famous, and from that time on, <coughs> Ilhan Omar, Rashida Taleb, everybody has used the same Quran to take the oath. <coughs> now, in 1787, in the state of Virginia, he talked about freedom of religion. And look what he wrote about Christianity. Millions of innocent men, women, and children since the introduction of Christianity have been burned, tortured, fined, and imprisoned. What has been the effect of this coercion to make one half of the world fools and the other half hypocrites to support roguery and error all over the earth? So basically what he was saying, we need to fight this Christianity. Because from the beginning of Christianity, it has done no good according to him, church Christianity. I need to differentiate between the spiritual Christianity and the historical and political Christianity, church one. So therefore, if you look at the history of Christian church, millions of people were burnt alive. Spanish Inquisitions, French Inquisitions. I mean, people were burnt alive just because of doubt. There could have not been more terrorism in the world than the terrorism which was done by the Christian state and by the Christian church. So therefore, this is what Thomas Jefferson was resenting. <clears throat> and he considered that the Bible is the most corrupted book on the face of the earth. 
for if we could believe that he, Jesus, really basically wrote these follies, these corruptions, then basically he says that he was a fanatic and he did not believe that Jesus is the one who wrote this Bible. It was later on written and put in his name. So therefore, according to him, to get rid of this Bible is the most important part of bringing enlightenment to the world. So remember, he is studying the Quran and taking notes. He is studying the Bible and then he started cutting the Bible into pieces. After studying the Quran, that this cannot be from God. This cannot be from God. So look at, this is his Bible in Smithsonian. This is Thomas Jefferson's Bible. He picked up the Bible, he picked up the razor, and he started cutting. This can be from God, everything else is. That's what he said, that it is, astaghfirullah, rubbish. This is the biggest disgrace, according to him, to God, to believe these kind of irrational stuff. Am I clear? Look at, you know, how many passages he left and he just picked up a few of them, which talk about the oneness of God, which talk about morality, which talk about the what? You know, spirituality. He said, this is from God and everything else is rubbish, according to him. <clears throat> Do you see? Now, these are in Smithsonian. When you go, you go to Thomas Jefferson <coughs> Bible and you can see it with your own eyes. And then from all of these 500, 600 pages, he got 26 pages. He said, this is from God and everything else is corrupted. So this is what is called Thomas Jefferson's Bible. And this is given as a gift to every visiting head of state. Every visiting head of state is given a gift. Thomas Jefferson, don't kill, don't cheat, don't lie. There's no God but one God. And I want you to watch this Smithsonian documentary, Jefferson's Secret Bible, because he was afraid that he will be killed. He will be burnt alive. So he said, don't publish it until I die. He was secretly communicating with John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, Madison, all of them, but he was so scared that he is going to be burnt alive. So he did not want these things to be. So these are published after his death. And that's where if you see this documentary, Jefferson's Secret Bible, you will be really astonished. <clears throat> Now, let's talk about Trinity. As you know, Trinity to Christianity is like our Shahada. When somebody wants to become Muslim, we say what? Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. They talk about God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and God the Son. So Trinity is very fundamental. So if somebody does not believe in Trinity, that person is no more Christian. Now, look at what he says. <clears throat> this paradox that one is three and three but one is so incomprehensible to the human mind that no candid man can say he has any idea of it. And how can he believe what presents no idea? How can somebody say, I understand Trinity, I have got the idea, I... This is such a kind of stupidity according to him. How can you understand it? He who thinks he does only deceives himself. He proves also that man, once surrendering his reason, has no remaining guard against absurdities the most monstrous. To him, to say God is one in three and three in one is the absurdity of the most what? Monster level. And like a ship without rudder is the support of every wind. Like when there's no anchor, Wherever you go, so nobody can prove Trinity. This one says that, that one says different. So that's where he says that this is the absurdity. <clears throat> and he says the doctrine, which was originally 
preached by Jesus is so simple that a child can understand. But thousands of years and volumes of explanation of Trinity, this nonsense can never be explained. Can you imagine? If somebody comes and says Shahada is nonsense, Quran is nonsense, Quran is corrupt, would you consider him as a Muslim or Christian or non-Muslim? I mean, now when these people come and say, this country is a Christian country, our founding father, yes, they were born and raised as Christians, but their belief system was not. They were actually going against the established church and Christianity and basing this country upon Islamic Unitarianism. I will give a series of lectures because you saw the book is so big. So it will take me maybe a year to explain to you all of these things. Honestly, there's a hidden history. <clears throat> okay, now George Sale translated Allahu Ahad, Allahu Samad, Lam Yalid wa Lam Yulad wa Lam Yakullahu Kufu wa Ahad. He translated it as the doctrine of one God. Allahu Ahad. Allahu Samad, pure and uncompounded. And Thomas Jefferson used the same word. He says that the doctrine of one God, pure and uncompounded, Allahu Ahad, Allahu Samad, was that of the early ages of Christianity. Early Christianity believed in what? Allahu Ahad, Allahu Samad. Thinking men of all nations, he proclaimed, rallied readily to the doctrine of one only God. <clears throat> Instead of saying Muslims, Christian Jews, he's not using, he's saying thinking people of all nations believed in one concept, which is the one and only God. And here is the most important letter he wrote to his own nephew. <clears throat> And he says, and I rejoice that in this blessed country of free inquiry and belief, which has surrendered its creed and conscience to neither kings nor priests, the genuine doctrine of one only God is reviving. And I trust that there is not a young man now living in the United States who will not die a Unitarian. So this is what they were doing. They were going against Christianity, believing that Bible is corrupted, Trinity is nonsense, there's no compulsion in the matters of religion, and they were reviving the Unitarianism. Muwahid, Tawheed, Unitarianism. And I will tell you that those Unitarians started from Istanbul when they went and worked over there, <clears throat> so this Unitarian movement was started in 16th century. It played havoc in England, and when they were persecuted, they came and migrated to Boston. John Adam was the member of that church, Unitarian church. So these were secretly Unitarians. So they incorporated the Islamic concept of separation of church and state, <clears throat> religious freedom, inalienable human rights, basically life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness is the summarized version of the five objectives of Islamic Sharia, and I'll tell you the secret communication between him and John Adam. Honestly, <clears throat> this is the part we need to share with our children. This is the part we need to share with our Jewish and Christian brothers and sisters who say, Islam has offered nothing. You go back to your country. This is a Christian country. One time, when one of the big leaders of Christian evangelical church, <coughs> after discussing, as you know, my PhD is in comparative religion, and I'm not sure, I mean, you can go on my website, sheikhzulfikar.com, and you can look at some of those pictures. My supervisor, Professor Paul Badham, was the known Christian theologian of his time. He's still alive, very old. 
He challenged me and I challenged him. And for seven years he grilled me because, you know, one time he said, you are trashing my religion and you expect me to give you PhD on it? <laughs> I mean, what do you expect me? He will go and he will talk to his dad. His dad was chaplain to the Queen of England, Lindsay Barrett. And his father will tell him, actually, this guy studies medieval Islam and medieval attacks on Islam. You have studied modern. That's where you are unable to answer him. You need to study the medieval philosophy. And then at the end, we became friends. He changed his mind. He wrote a book that Jesus is not God. It's a metaphor. Am I clear? So, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, you know, when I studied these things, I felt that this is something which is hidden from the whole world. They do not want the Muslim world to wake up. That's where they do not want to tell you your legacy. It is our responsibility to reclaim that legacy, to tell people that had it not been to Islamic ideas, there would have been no America. There would have been no justice. And remember one thing I can tell you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just. Wherever there is justice, he will bless it. <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm having <coughs> difficulty. I mean, look at our country. Do you see there's justice? Do you think that everybody is equal in front of law? There's one Sharia for the royals and the other for, there's one Sharia for those who have got the power and this other law, you can keep on putting them in jail 17 years, 8 years, 9 years, whenever they agree to you, all of them are gone and now they become the prime minister. So either you are Waziri Azam or Asiri Azam, this is the type of justice we are having. But here in America, you come here after 5 years, you are a citizen, you and any white dude who is born and raised here or black dude is equal in front of law. You come here and you get citizenship after five years. In our countries, you stay there for 35 years, you still have to renew your ikama every year. And if the kafil becomes upset with you, after 35 years of what service, he will kick you out in one day. Now you know why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is blessing. You can have your own masjids. Do you know in Ramadan, in Egypt and in Saudi Arabia, the orders have been issued now, a month before Ramadan, that you will not be able to do taraweeh in loudspeaker. You just call the azan and then close the loudspeaker. You will not be able to do a tikaf in the masjid. If you have to do the a tikaf, get the security clearance. In Saudi Arabia, they used to have these tents outside for iftar. This was the most beautiful thing I have ever witnessed. You go anywhere, Masjid Nabawi, <coughs> Kaaba, any masjid, you just walk in and everybody is begging you to come and do the iftar with them. Now it is what? Prohibited. You cannot put the, because they do not want anybody to talk about Gaza or to talk about, am I clear? And here we have been criticizing Creepy Joe, Sleepy Joe, Terrorist Joe, at least so far, nobody has knocked at my door and nobody has put me in the jail. Am I clear? You see the difference? This is what is Islam. I disagree with the policies. I disagree with so many of things. But whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will see that the justice is not given to a common person, Allah, he will take the barakah away. And when Muslims will go and follow the same justice, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not zalim that he will bless the enemies and not bless his believers. Because he knows that if these Muslims are given the authority, they will destroy the world in one day. Khuda ganje ko nakhan na de. Am I clear? We are very good at destruction. We do not know how to make things. Am I clear? We do not know how to talk to each other. 
we get a little bit power, we want to destroy everything possible. Years of efforts, days of efforts are gone in one second. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to run the affairs of his world. That's where he is. So we need to repent to Allah. We need to understand the essence of Islam. And we need to get back to our history, reclaim it. And then once we are ready for the leadership, Allah will give us the leadership. Sayyidina Ali used to say that Al-Mulku yabka al kufri wa la yabka ma'asul. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give the authority to a kafir, but he will not give it to a zalim. There is zulm in our countries, and we need to repent to Allah, and we need to get back to the essence of Islam. And honestly, whenever I talk to the American fellows, and sometimes they make jokes with us, you know, where are you from? Yes, I'm from Pakistan. And sometimes when I criticize their religious tradition, sometimes they say, look, if God was pleased with you, you will not be sitting here. It shows me that God, my God is stronger than your God. And one time I made a joke, I said, actually, you built this country based upon my God. <laughs> and I quoted Thomas Jefferson. He said, I never saw this. Let me go back and double check it. When he checked the reference, he said, he was a heretic, heretic. He was not a believer. Am I clear? So this is what we want to share with everybody. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it. And forgive me, my professor. I was not supposed to be speaking so long in your presence, but I had no choice. Thank you, everybody.